right, thank you everybody for coming today. Um, we are excited to be here talking about climate project finance. Uh, I'm David McCollum, um, an adjunct professor in the Energy Science and Engineering Department and a research fellow, fellow with the Steyer Taylor Center, now part of uh, Stanford SFI. Um, and I think one of the things we learned from Clean Tech 1.0 in the 2008 era is that uh, using one tool to try to develop every company, build every project um, is not going to work. And we're going to need more solutions for that. We're going to need some creativity and uh, different ways to bring solutions to market. And so I think what we'll hear from, uh, from our guest speakers today is that there still is no one solution, one playbook to follow. Um, but there's a whole bunch of ways that have been done that are that are being developed. Um, and I think the, the purpose of this research is to kind of pull the kernels of truth of how you can do it repeatably and uh, how we can how we can use that to go um, put more megawatts into the ground, put more real projects in uh, into the world. And so it's going to take somebody like Madison, who's got experience across startups, government, investment, all of that to kind of see the uh, the trends and uh, the repeatability in those things. So that's why we're happy to have her doing this research and bringing these amazing speakers to um, share how they've done it before. And so let's please give Madison a round of applause. Awesome. Well, thank you, David. I'm really excited to chat with you all about some research that I've been doing for the past few months here. And basically why we started doing this research was, as David mentioned, um, one of the biggest challenges for climate tech is getting to scale. Because when you think about all of the incredible solutions that are here at Stanford, that are coming out of labs today, that have immense potential for impact on the climate ecosystem, it's all fantastic. But the actual emissions that we're looking at uh, reducing are going to come when we get these projects or these, these technologies to project scale, when these are deployed repeatedly across the world, solving real steel in the ground infrastructure challenges. And so, you know, when we're thinking about this pathway to scale, we're, we have to be thinking simultaneously about where the financing is coming from in order to drive these technologies forward. And an apologies to folks in the room. I realize it's only on one screen. We tried earlier, <laughs> but I think the a lot of this will be in the report as well, which we'll send around later. Um, but one of the biggest challenges for early climate technologies that we're looking at today that are really exciting and have a lot of potential is that you know there's a tremendous amount of um, financing available at full scale once a technology has been de-risked. You can look at you know more traditional forms of infrastructure investment that are looking at a very repeatable um, project portfolio. There's also a lot of opportunities for technologies to get funding at very early stages. Venture capital. We think about um, you know academic research grants, and there's also a lot of opportunities through organizations like ARPA-E to fund really early stage innovative research. But there's a big gulf in the middle. This gap that's been called you know the Valley of Death in other technology spheres, um, and keeps getting pointed to as this sort of first of a kind folk uh, gulf here, where. This is a stage where it's much too big in terms of capital need for a lot of early investment. We're thinking about project scales where there's often you know, tens if not hundreds of millions of dollars that need to be put into a project to make it real. Uh, at the same time, you know, it's not yet attractive to a lot of these later stage investors that are interested in coming in when the technology has been de-risked, when the developer has been proven that they can build the technology, build the project over and over again. Um, and so addressing that is really important. And we've seen a bunch of coverage, at least in the sort of very niche climate tech newsletters that I love to read about, you know, the need for more first of a kind financing, the need for investors to be able to back these types of projects, the, the unknown quantity of projects that are all going to fall into this field in the next few years. But I think one of the things that's been missing when I started this research was that there's not a ton of evidence out there digging into past examples of these projects. And so, you know, we could have pulled all the way back to clean tech 1.0. We could have thought about early days of solar and wind, but I wanted to look at a couple of recent examples of climate tech companies that have been in the news um, and that have really been impacting the, the ecosystem in a number of ways and look at how they had gotten to their first commercial scale project. So 
I went out and talked to a ton of folks so that you don't have to. And um, this includes a bunch of startups that are that have deployed a first commercial scale project, uh, startups that are looking at deploying commercial scale projects, investors that have backed some of these projects, investors that are creating new mechanisms that are looking out at the landscape of more flexible infrastructure financing, um, and some you know, stakeholders and other organizations like Rocky Mountain Institute that I think are doing a lot of really incredible work and thought about what the climate ecosystem looks like at each stage of scale. So we put together this guidebook. It'll be live later today, and we'll send it back around. Uh, and the guidebook covers a couple of things. And so we brought in four case studies to go into a lot more detail than this and sort of previously publicly put together about each of these projects and what were the strategies to scaling, not just on financing, but you know, how did you structure your partnerships? Who was your contractor that you brought in? What did that look like? What was your customer relationship like? And, and a lot of this is also resting on a reframing of projects in the climate space, away from just thinking about what is the capital stack. That chart I showed earlier was just, you're just trying to get up to 100%. To what does the entire project life cycle look like? And I think that the space where in a lot of parallel industries, you have folks who are extremely experienced project developers who know that you know a lot of the factors that filter into these projects are not just the capital that goes into the, the actual final agreement, but also all of these nuances around you know, customer technology, um, development partners, um, you know, risk abatement. And so ultimately, you know, we come in and, and I had a great um, partner on this work. Um, Guy, my friend Guy, who works at Hannon Armstrong, has also done a lot of education through the Clean Energy Leadership Institute, and he's helped me put together a, quite a bit of detail from sort of a project financier point of view. What are all the questions that you want to ask when you get to a project stage? And our hope is that by putting this together with the case studies, um, earlier stage project climate tech companies will be able to think about their pathway to project scale as an approach to mitigating a lot of these risks, to thinking through in each of these, what emphatically is are the questions that investors will have down the line, that partners will have down the line, and how might we start to mitigate these, whether it's hiring the right people who have really deep experience from a parallel space really early on to help kind of formulate what your project even looks like, whether it's optimizing for a really replicable type of project so that you can just you know, be able to link multiple projects together and reduce uncertainty between them, um, or whether it's thinking about structuring your customer relationships and being really tactical about what types of customers you're signing on or you're starting to enter into agreements with in, in early days. Um, so this is, and again, apologies for folks in the room, it's small, but we, there's a couple of charts in here with really detailed questions and a number of ideas around strategies that, that startups can take to talk about these. I went into four case studies in the report, um, Furbo Energy, which will be joined by shortly, Rondo, Via Separations, who will also be joining us, and Monolith. And each of these companies is, is different and a different profile. You know, Furgo is producing power into it's ultimately like a very sophisticated commodity market where they can sign power purchase agreements in long term with customers who are seeking low carbon power. Um, Rondo is providing a heat as a service installation on customer facilities at smaller scale. Um, Via Separations is also looking into that or is providing industrial separations to customers cited on customer facilities, which presents its own new set of both benefits and, and risks to consider. Um, and the monolith is producing a commodity materials into two different markets that already exist today that have green attributes. And so Furbo and Vio will be joining us to talk a little bit more about their initial projects, but I just wanted to give a bit more of an example on what the case studies include in the guidebook. And so this is on monolith. Monolith is a company that was founded back in 2012. Um, they have recently built, or over the last few years, have built a really large facility in Nebraska. And what they, they do in their process is they use methane and they produce both carbon black, which is an input into a lot of materials, including tires, as well as uh, hydrogen, or ultimately in their market, green ammonia for fertilizer. And they're able to do this at a 97% carbon reduction on the products that are available at the market scale today. Um, and so 
when looking at their project in their Nebraska facility, a few things that really stood out to me, aside from the very sophisticated approach that they had taken to thinking about how to delineate risk between their partners and how to really bracket out who on their capital table was ultimately um, responsible for different types of risks uh, at different stages. But they also were really thoughtful about their offtake. They introduced a couple of pretty interesting op options for offtake. Not only did they partner with pretty significant public facing um, consumers of their goods early on, even before they had signed full long-term contracts with these to sort of be promoting their, their material. But they also explored using some functions like a, a revenue guarantee from a third party that allowed them to sort of in many ways like borrow the balance sheet of a much larger, more creditworthy partner to ensure that they would ultimately be providing revenue and be able to sell their material. Um, and just to add a little more description there, they, they partnered with a, or they found a partner who had promised to buy their commodities at scale, a little bit of a discount if they weren't able to find another buyer. And this allowed them to then be able to go around and turn, turn to other part, financial partners for loan. Um, and they also brought in strategic investors. They brought in private equity partners early on rather than venture capital, which isn't the model for every climate tech project development. But by doing this, by, by giving themselves the funding to get to a much larger scale and just a you know a lab prototype. They gave themselves the runway to be able to really build pretty quickly to a large scale pilot project in California that while not profit making was revenue generating, demonstrated the process, demonstrated the process at scale and was able to get them up to the next stage. Um, I'd also point to something with, with them that I think Fervo will also touch on is the idea and the concept of being able to build you know, your facilities and stages. So they have built one facility in Nebraska. They're going to build another larger facility on the same land. But by being able to, to stage this, they're able to demonstrate the technology, get real clear certainty on the costs of the project at that scale, um, and then get much more attractive financing for you know, the next step. And so by by staging things, instead of going immediately for the largest possible scale for their first facility, they're able to ultimately you know, generate much better returns, be able to bring in different types of capital partners who can work to the first stage um, for a degree of certainty. And so I think you know, a couple of key takeaways, and then you know, in a few minutes, I'd love to hand over to, to our speakers who are coming in to speak about Verbo and Via. You know, I think a couple of four things that really stood out to me about both the case studies that I include in the guidebook, as well as a number of the other companies I spoke to, is that the team is really crucial. I think this is something that hasn't been included in all of the conversation about just finding first of a kind of capital and meeting investors, but almost all the companies I spoke to have gotten to a really significant scale, either in the last few years or in the first iteration of Clean Tech, um, really pointed to the fact that they brought on very experienced development talent pretty early in their project lifespan. So this was, you know, maybe a few years before they were even actually going to go out to start building the project. And, and by bringing in folks who are thinking about, you know, the trade-offs, the challenges of being able to scale up of technology, the importance of, you know, permitting, the importance of community engagement, the importance of uh, the contractor that you partner with, um, it really eased their pathway for development because they were then optimizing for slightly different things than just maximum technology efficiency or sort of, you know, a, a perfect scenario of just one to one scale. Um, another thing that I touched on a little bit with Monolith is the idea of really being creative with offtake. And so this is, you know, both some of the options I mentioned that Monolith had explored around, could you find a revenue guarantee from a third party if you're producing a commodity? on a market where you know you might not have many buyers that want to sign a long-term contract, but you have investors who want to see long-term certainty. Um, this is also an opportunity to explore whether you can find partners who are also um, strategic investors and are looking to partner with you in multiple capacities across the project development. Um, and then you know, thinking about the replicability of your projects. So optimizing for, and I think, you know, Rondo is one of the companies here that has really done, um, focused a lot of their efforts on this is, you know, being able to point to the fact that there is very little difference between each of their installed projects. They're also like say bricks and wires for Rondo, or you could say for other projects, it's just like the exact same system of, you know, filtration membranes or, you know, installed uh, storage on a site. 
And, and being able to point to the minimal differences allows investors to reduce the amount of time needed and um, effort needed to diligence each individual project. And then finally, you know, in embarking on this, I think I was looking to answer some of those headlines about who's going to finance all of the first of a kind projects out there. And, you know, I think one of the things that really this affirmed for me was that there's no silver bullet, there's no perfect answer for first of a kind climate, because there's no one type of first of a kind climate project. You know, the projects I mentioned vary super widely in scale from everything from a couple you know, tens of millions of dollars on a customer site where you're dealing with very different dynamics between your customer and your installation, but you also do land purchase and permitting in the same way, all the way up to, you know, you're providing a massive um, a massive generation of power in a remote area. Like these are just very different types of projects when it comes to risks associated with them. Um, and what amongst those important risks I flagged earlier are the, the biggest or um, the most dangerous. And so with that, I think, you know, investors are also evaluating them so differently that it's really important to find parallels uh, with other projects out there rather than just trying to think of first of a kind as one bucket of climate finance. Um, and one thing I'd also mention is, you know, most of the projects I profiled here, even though many of them have brought in some really nuanced, interesting financing, whether it's loans that were given because of other attributes and just, you know, the greenness of the project and, you know, to produce jobs in a rural area um, or for, for other reasons, or whether this was finding equipment financing to kind of layer in and reduce, you know, the capital needs for the project. Almost all these projects required a lot of equity from the companies. And so I think when you're thinking about building towards project scale for climate startups, assuming that there is not going to be this magical instrument that comes in, and is it really easily able to finance these projects? I think it's really important to kind of have a really clear eye on to how you're going to finance and get to that stage without totally diluting your, your company's equity. Um, and so, you know, thinking about those bespoke capital partnerships is really valuable, but it's going to be you know, really, really unique to each of these projects. Um, and with that, I wanted to introduce two folks who are going to come and join us today on the screen. Um, so Shreya is going to start us off. You know, Shreya, if you can hear us, but Shreya is the CEO and co-founder of Via Separations, uh, which is an industrial separations company, and they offer a decarbonization solution to a lot of our most pressing and hard to abate uh, mm -hmm. challenges in the chemical, pulp and paper industry, food beverage. Really happy to be here and, and talk a little bit about via separations. And, and I have three um, three points to dovetail to, to what Madison said about our first of a kind experience. Um, first, I'll start off with who we are. Um, we are a um, industrial decarbonization company focused on the separation step in raw material manufacturing. So many of us don't think about this, but about 70% of the cost of producing a raw material or chemical is the separation step that accounts for about 15% of global energy consumption. Um, and in the US, more emissions than the steel and cement industries. Um, so what we do is offer a efficiency so converting from industrial heat to um, um, filtration system requires 90% less energy. And we offer the electrification of using pumps instead of steam to drive the process. Um, we are a, a technology company at heart, scaled up 100 million times since leaving the lab in order to get to the first of a kind plant, um, which is an actual number. We, we started very small, but we went to, you know, postage stamp and notebook paper and, and on from there. Uh, we have about two uh, football fields of membrane in operation in our commercial facility now. Um, and, uh, uh, and that is in the pulp and paper industry, which is uh, a beachhead market for us and and a really exciting exciting opportunity. So three things I wanted to offer on on first of a kind. Um, the first is that first of a kinds to to us and to our investors are about retiring risk. Um, the the there's two different types of risk. There there's a lot of different types of risk, but fundamentally technical risk and market risk. 
Um, and a first of a kind plant does both. They, it retires the ability, um, the, the technical perspective of scale up, and it retires some amount of commercial risk with an offtake agreement. Um, and so as we're thinking about designing the scale, the scale, the scope, the, the budget for a first of a kind, we're thinking about how much does that re retiring each of those, um, each of those offer. Um, I think that a first of a kind is different from a pilot in that it is a commercially relevant, uh, both scale and, and, and potentially even economics. Um, a pilot is probably negative unit economics, and a first of a kind hopefully has positive unit economics. I think the phrase demonstration exists somewhere in between, um, and, and people might have different de definitions, but that's sort of how we've thought about it. Um, the second thing to, to talk about is scale. So we had a very pivotal uh, set of few months, set of few board meetings, deciding whether to implement at a 10x scale from our pilot or a 100x scale from our pilot. And the, the, the key things that we were thinking about were, number one, what does the customer care about? What retires risk in the customer eyes that allows us to be rep replicable and scale? Number two, uh, what is the real risk? 100x sounds really, really scary, um, but, but what is the real risk? And in our case, we're installing many different modules and those modules were actually only twice the size of the pilot, not 100 times. And so the, the engineering complexity goes up, but the scientific complexity doesn't go up very much. And the third thing was around timeline and burn. Uh, many of us in the early stage companies um, are looking at burn as also dilutive capital. Um, and so as we think about the trade-offs between putting dollars towards a project versus towards timeline to get to that project financed in a different way, um, or potentially even a cheaper project, we think about what what is the total. We don't look just at the individual projects, but we look at also the time it takes us to get there. Um, so ultimately, we decided to go for that 100x. Um, from the pilot to the first of a kind, that plant, and I'm I'm not sure if I was supposed to have slides, I don't, but that plant is being commissioned now. It is undergoing its startup phase now. I was thinking about photos of, of that plant. I can share them later. Uh, and that uh, allows us, yeah, that's, it, it's inside that white building there. Um, and the, uh, so far, so good on that technical risk complexity. Uh, and I will say that I think we underestimated the engineering complexity of, of scaling up a little bit. And to the a point that Madison made about having the right team in place, um, some of those things were things we could have avoided otherwise. And then the third thing I think about with first of a kind is the ticket size. Um, you know, if you're put building a new cement plant, um, that ticket size for a first of a kind is a lot larger than when, what we're talking about. We're talking about tens of millions, not hundreds of millions and, um, and low tens. Um, and so uh, how you finance that, how that relates to burn, how that um, kind of what those trade-offs are on risk and returns and what the unit economics need to be uh, really come back to, to ticket size. And then they also come to how you finance it. You're, you, you can't uh, fully finance, well, you potentially could, but you probably wouldn't fully finance a $200 million facility with equity dollars, but you could if it was five or 10. And so having a bit of, of, of boundary conditions on, on what makes sense there, I think is an important point. Um, I'll pause there unless you wanted me to say anything else, Madison. You know, I think Shreya has just given us a, a bunch of points about how their experience has been in the scale up. And if folks have questions, would love to open it up. I have a few too, but want to make sure we have time because I know it's a little tight here. Um, so would you like to go ahead? And if you wouldn't mind just maybe introducing yourself too, because I think Shreya might not be able to see you. I think we might be on the back. Uh, the back. Yeah, my name is Andrew. Uh, I'm along with Stanford. I work in climate investing. Uh, uh, maybe that's a stage. So this is a big topic of conversation for us how companies can cross that valley. Um, I'm curious what the process was like to figure out your own sort of version of of folk. Um, when does that process start? Is it is it at the C stage, or are you already sort of laying the foundation for that? And how sort of iterative is along the way? Yeah, 
Yeah, no, thanks for thanks for the question. We've been thinking about what is the scope. So we've been th we thought about what is the scope of a pilot from the day we started the company. Um, and then we thought about what is the scope of the first of a kind, the, the day we started piloting successfully, um, because it's really the next milestone, right, for the company from a commercial perspective. And in both cases, all the technology development, all the team stuff, all the fundraising milestones that happen in between are means to an end. And and it's it's the customer traction that ends it matters at the end of the day. So we had a hypothesis that anything that didn't move the needle for the economic of a of a paper mill wasn't wasn't commercially relevant and and our hypothesis was let's build the smallest plant we can in terms of throughput for the um, for it to to move the needle because as we come down the cost curve uh, we want to we want to build more plants when they're cheaper we always would have to build a first plant it's always going to be more expensive than the rest of the plants and so let's build the smallest first plant we can possibly possibly build to give you a sense of scale our second plant is going to be twice the capacity. And on a per unit basis, it's going to be 75% less expensive. And that's just from the uh, supply chain, the modularization, the learnings coming off of the first plant, the timeline being a little bit longer because we de-risked uh, the customer a little bit. And so those sorts of things matter drastically. And so it, it really made sense to be as small as possible. Why we didn't do a 10x plant, which would have been cheaper, uh, was uh, two two main drivers. Number one, the we call them the getting out of bed costs are are still significant. You still need to, uh, thank you. Uh, you still need to um, pour the concrete. You still need to do the tie-ins for electricity and the the plumbing. Uh, you still need to negotiate the ground lease with the customer to put that equipment on on site. So all of those costs were already going to exist, whether we did a 10x or a commercial or a 100x and, and 100x being commercially relevant. But the revenue wasn't going to be there. The revenue wasn't the, the, the unit economics were going to actually be worse, even though the, the ticket size was going to be lower because it wasn't commercially relevant to the customer. The customer saw this as a pilot. Anything smaller than what we're building right now would be viewed as a pilot. Nice go. Yeah, go ahead. Hi, Sharon. My name's Tom. Thanks for joining us. I'm curious for the, the first of a kind is obviously puts you in a precarious situation for negotiating. So can you talk to us a little bit about how those negotiations went, maybe some lessons learned? Absolutely. So I think the first and most important thing is uh, working with a customer that understood that this was a first of a kind, that there was uh, nothing. I mean, it's not a secret. It's not a surprise. Um, but what for them to really understand what that meant, um, for them to uh, recognize the the challenges of a company that's scaling, and you know we don't have um, you know forty five engineers on staff to to be at their beck and call, right? And and so having the um, having the understanding of of who we are and what we were trying to do. And then also having the, my mom would call it stick to itiveness to, to, to walk us through the, the, the process and, and uh, get to a successful completion was really important. How did we know that we had that in this customer? Well, we asked for things in the contract that would not typically be in the off take agreement that would not typically be associated with um, a, 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 an agreement. So. For example, um, we have sort of like a, a a period with which if we don't meet a, a, a performance metric, we have time to to come back up and meet that performance metric. That's not typically how offtake agreements are structured. And so the flexibility there helped us be convinced that the customer understood that this is what was happening. Um, another example, this was well into the um, construction phase. Um, but I'm on the phone with the customer on Thanksgiving morning, and it's not Thanksgiving there because it's Canada, um, but I'm on the phone with the customer and I said, hey, here's a problem we're having. Um, this is the worst case outcome. This is the best case outcome. And his response in the moment, our champion's response in the moment was, Shrey, you know I don't give up that easy. Let's go for best case scenario here. And and that type of attitude is something that especially um, 
especially for large industrial companies, is not very common. And, and we knew it when we saw it. Um, so, so I think those are a couple of examples, but I think a real big piece of it was understanding who our customer was, and then also helping them understand, A, what this meant for their larger portfolio and their economics, their, their corporate EBITDA, and two, um, um, uh, setting, uh, setting terms that were fair, explaining why it mattered to us that we did a thing, that we had this term of contract le length, um, it was, was I don't want to say surprisingly, but very, very valuable um, because once you got to the why and the why behind their perspective and the why behind our perspective, we often found we were more on the same page than we thought we were. And Sherry, one thing that I wanted to maybe have you touch on too was you mentioned really knowing your customer. And I think one of the things that I, I called out in the case is when we were talking about, you know, I've, I've known Sherry for a number of years. And, and one of the things that's stood out to me about your approach is that you've really gotten to know the pulp and paper industry, which is their first market really deeply. And you shared, you had some done some data and analysis on the folks in the industry you talked to and the depth of really understanding where you fit in that I think really informed your sizing, your customer choice, your ability to really get those customers to sign on to, you know, the things that you mentioned were really instrumental and in getting an investor investor confirmation satisfaction. Could you talk a little bit more about that approach and some of those those data points? Yeah, definitely. So um, we are of the ethos that uh, a customer we don't know is not a customer and, and really want to understand both the objections, but also why it's valuable to them. Um, as part of doing that, uh, we've, we've learned and we've built sort of a proprietary software tool um, that allows us to kind of assess the heat and mass balances at, at the customer's facilities, help, um, help align on where the value creation is for a particular market. Um, the uh, areas, you know, regional energy prices or electricity prices matter when you're, when you're talking about scales that we're talking about here. And so being able to have that conversation in a very transparent way that shows that we are on the same team building value together. Um, when I started the company seven years ago, this is a little off topic. I thought that uh, sales would be, I would, it would, but when you view sales as building value together and finding an opportunity to help a customer, which is truly what we are doing here, it becomes a lot easier and a lot, lot more fun. Um, so I don't know if that entirely answered your question, Madison, but I think that both the, the tactical quantitative use of a software tool along with the relationship building to understand who each other is at, at start. And, and I'll tell you very honestly, I'll say this to our customer directly, their job is to protect their business, protect their asset, reduce the risk of the jobs, the people that they employ, reduce the risk of the, 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 the cement and steel in the ground. And it is our job to push the envelope. And that doesn't always match up that definitely creates tension there is an impedance mismatch between a large company and a small company but it is my job to bridge that gap. yeah and i think you know one of the things i i just want to flag that it talks about a little bit in the the case is the the speaking both with the parent company and the company that has you know a lot of the the capital and the interest in a sort of innovative climate solution up first of a kind to be partnering with as well as the facility managers and, and the folks who are going to be integrating the project and operationally making sure your installation works and is successful and leads to second, third, and of a kind facilities. Um, That's and absolutely think, true. Yeah, well, you know, sure. I really appreciate you joining us. I think there's a question in Zoom. Oh, have time. Yes, yeah. Um, would you like to read it out loud? Sure. And um, says, Treya, this is awesome. Thank you. When you thought about scaling, how did you think about the trade-offs trade -offs of owning operate assets on balance sheet versus let the pulp facility own the asset and you provide tech and maintenance? That is a, uh, let's call it the billion dollar question here for us um, as, as a company. Um, what I'll say is that in the early projects, first, second, third of a kind, we're, um, we are prioritizing speed 
to commercialization and and um, and so is our customer. So the reality is that our customer has a cheaper cost of capital than we do, even in um, probably the best case scenario for project financing. However, um, they have to choose to deploy that capital in something that's brand new, which is very infrequent in this industry. And so we said, look, we are in improving their operating budget all of the value created is in their operating budget why aren't we why aren't we, they also spending from their operating budget so that it can be an apples to apples comparison and so this allows us to um, take on the, the the perceived technology risk um, move these customers along a little bit faster leverage grants and other things that help bridge the gap for first of a first and early of a kind facilities um, and ultimately transition to selling in a way the customer wants to, to buy. If they want to support our, our, our more expensive cost of capital, that is totally fine with us. Um, however, we don't have to operate like that. We've got a razor razor blade model that allows us to generate recurring revenue regardless. And so that is a very big question for what, what happens after we have 12 months of operation here, which is a really kind of inflection point. Yeah, well, we're, um, I think, unfortunately, we're, we're reaching the end of our time because we're going to need to transfer over to having Gabe join us and speak a little bit more about Fervo. But if folks would like to reach out to Shreya afterwards, you know, I, Shreya, we've learned so much from you about how to scale up these sorts of projects and really excited to see how things continue to go with the, the next 12 months. Uh, well, it's my pleasure to also introduce Gabe Malik, who's the Chief of Staff at Fervo Energy. And similar to Shreya, Gabe is going to talk to us a little bit about Fervo's project which is based in Utah, and then would definitely love to encourage more questions um, about the project and about the pathway to scale. Awesome. Thanks, Madison. And thank you all for, for having Fervo today's event. Maybe just very quickly, for those who aren't familiar with us, we're a next generation geothermal power developer. We're taking proven oil and gas drilling technology, namely horizontal drilling and hydraulic fracturing, and we're applying that to geothermal energy development to, to ultimately produce around the clock clean electricity. And like Madison mentioned, we are hard at work on our first of a kind project in Southwest Utah, a project that we're calling Cape Station, which by 2028 will deliver 400 megawatts of clean energy to California off takers. And just a little bit of context, we began this project in June of last year. And this was shortly after we finished our first technical test at our pilot project in Northern Nevada, a project that we called uh, uh, Project Red. And Project Red was, like Shreya mentioned, it, it was proof of concept. We drilled two wells, we tested that well system, we mapped production data, and we connected those wells to an existing power plant. We really wanted to de-risk our technology and show that you could use oil and gas drilling techniques to reliably generate geothermal energy. So once we had the pilot in place, we moved to Utah and said, our technology risk is zero. What we need to solve for now is our operations risk and show the market that we can not just generate three and a half megawatts at a pilot scale, but real utility scale. Uh, and this, this aligns with Shreya's point on knowing your buyer. We're not going to be able to sustain this company long term on small one off three and a half megawatt projects. But now that we've scaled up to 90 megawatt projects, we are in our sweet spot. Um, so, so 90 megawatts we plan to deliver by 2026, and then a remaining 310 megawatts by 2028 to get us to that full 400 megawatt total for this first of a kind project in Southwest Utah. A couple points I'll just highlight and want to devote as much time as we have to questions. First is looking at the non-technical factors to de-risk. And I think this is really important because oftentimes when I hear a discussion of first of a kind, the conversation becomes, well, how do you show investors or off-takers that your technology is good to go? And Yes, we've had those conversations. We faced skepticism as we were raising our Series D, and we have to show our off takers that, yes, here are the actual flow test results from our pilot project that give us confidence to scale up. But actually, the opportunities for risk 
are quite diverse and actually most of them don't have anything to do with technology. So what does the local community think of our project? Do we have sufficient labor to actually build this power, power plant between now and 2026? Do we think we're gonna have government support throughout this entire project development process? Are we going to be able to get permits in time? These are all maybe, maybe you'd call them soft factors or soft risks, but they're actually much more material when you've graduated from that pilot phase and are going to your true first of a kind, because ideally you should know that your technology works. And a lot of the hesitance and reluctance that investors are, are sharing is on your ability to operate. And operations involve so much beyond just the core technology. Um, the second point I would make is on first of a kind, not just involving tech innovation, but um, all forms of innovation. We've really tried to embrace that at Burvo, and I think that's helped us deliver so far. To be a bit more specific, we think about innovation on our legal team. We think about it on our financing team, and that has been a secret sauce for us. I'll, I'll give a, a concrete example. So on the legal side, we knew that to make this first of a kind project work, we were going to need to access tax credits through the Inflation Reduction Act. We would need not just the base rate investment tax credit or production tax credit, but we would need the bonus credit that comes with prevailing wage and apprenticeship requirements. The geothermal industry doesn't have existing apprenticeship programs that are registered with the Department of Labor. So what are we going to do? We can't forego this 5x bonus credit. So we are very intentional about reaching out to a local university near our project site, Southern Utah University, and we've worked with them over the last five to six months to build an apprenticeship program from scratch that does two things. It gives us access to these bonus tax credits, and it really forges an authentic and deep relationship with the local community. No other geothermal developer in the country is devoting time to this pretty niche aspect of IRA compliance, but it's those little pieces of innovation that actually allow a first of a kind project to succeed. We're also structuring the legal entities of our project in slightly creative ways so that we can try to access both the investment tax credit and the production tax credit for this one project, treating our well field as one legal entity and our power plant as another. And we've worked with outside counsel over time to, to iterate on that. And so I think my message really is, is that first of a kind, it extends so much further beyond technology. And while it's important to continue to find ways to make your technology more efficient and cost effective, some of the ways you're going to be able to do that and ultimately de-risk the project will come from matters that have very little to do with your technology across, across the company. Um, so I'll, I'll pause there to, to leave sufficient time for questions and we can get into any aspect of Burbo's Cape Station project. Amazing. Thanks, Gabe. I think we've got a question already. Thanks, Gabe. Um, so I'm a graduate student studying energy building in hydrogen. Uh, my question is around what you just said about maximizing innovation under different aspects of the company. Um, how do you balance out like getting stuff done quickly, because that's another key thing, you know, there's money running out while also thinking about, okay, when do we be innovative in solving problems and, you know, what else can we do better than what others are doing? And then, like, there's a balance between just making, like, getting shit done. Uh, so how do you, like, balance that out? And yeah, that's no great. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I was just saying, like, and know when to innovate and when to just do it. Yeah, yeah, it's a great question. And I think my response aligns in part with with comments Shreya provided, which is having firm targets and a firm target setting process when you start either the project or you start a new performance year. So this is top of mind for me right now because we just unveiled our new performance year goals to the rest of the company today, which will cover us from today, 12 months from now. And everybody is aware of those targets. Everybody's own personal OKRs flow up to those targets. And so that creates boundaries 
within which we can innovate. And, and that gives us a little test internally. If we start to go down a rabbit hole, we think it might be innovative, we think it might add value, but then it doesn't ultimately connect up to one of those overarching corporate goals for the year, then we stop doing it. And we just start to standardize processes, even if we think there are some marginal improvements we could unlock later on. Um, so, so I'll give you one example on our turbine sizing for this project in Utah. We knew that we had a specific goal for the calendar year to have signed a turbine supply agreement with a uh, major turbine uh, OEM. And we had a date by which we wanted to do that. And so we were thinking of ways that we could innovate our well design to change the temperature of the geothermal fluid, which would impact the sizing of the turbine. We kept playing around with it, kept playing around with it. But then we looked at the calendar we had set for ourselves and we, we looked, we had this firm date, we needed to pick a turbine supplier. And so we just had to stop, we had to stop innovating there. We had to stop running our production models and say, we are standardizing our turbine units for this first project at this megawatt size. And for the sake of efficiency and cost reduction, we are going to lock in this number and every turbine is going to be, uh, in this case, around 36 megawatts. Um, and there are ways that that's hurting, that would hurt us long term if we just stuck blindly to 36, but we just have to do it for first of a kind, to your point, to to be efficient with our money. And my name is me. I'm a co-founder of our town call. It's a startup. My questions are about your community risks. So, you know, more of the fitness. What kind of challenges do you face in terms of cultural, social, political risks? You know, in front of them as well, or some ready customers? I think a lot of the de-risking comes at the very beginning with site selection. And one thing we've learned is it's actually better to load a lot of the community engagement work early in the project than try to do it on the back end. Because if you if you try to initiate a project in a community that's just averse to it no matter what, and you find that out only after you pick the location, then you're you're constantly fighting this tension with local groups. We were very intentional about our site selection for Cape Station in that it sits adjacent to an existing Department of Energy project uh, that has been testing enhanced geothermal methods in Southwest Utah for a number of years. And so the community was already familiar with the exact type of geothermal that we're trying to do. And because that project is run by the University of Utah, in partnership with the DOE, they also felt comfortable with information sharing as it relates to geothermal projects. They understand what seismic risk means. They understand what fracking means. It wasn't just that they were open to the project. It's that they're, they're more familiar with the concepts of what we're doing, which made this a really de-risk site for us from a community engagement standpoint. So the risks that we face today are less with the town of Milford or Beaver County, Utah. And I think they're more about um, federal government turnover. And this is something that's not unique to Fervo, but depending on how the federal election goes in November, our loan programs office application could be potentially at risk, given, given what the Trump administration did the last time they were in office in, in gutting the LPO. So we think about that sort of and maybe it's wrong to call it a community engagement risk, but we think about that sort of policy risk more acutely than we do the community side because we were so purposeful at the get-go to pick a site um, where we thought we would have community support. Really enjoyed your comments. Um, we can talk ge geothermal gossip sometime, but I'm the guy responsible for one of the only non-format projects that are currently in the ground for us. What I did was I went to Reddit, which uh, has its advantages and disadvantages. But uh, I'm typically three to five years ahead of the market. So I look back and said, if I just waited three years, it would have been a lot easier. My guess, so this is a question about project finance. My guess is that you know, I get calls from Wall Street saying, hey, we need to spend, we need to invest 10 or $100 million a month. You have any projects for us? 
And my thinking is that um, there's such a, a dearth of uh, project vehicles that um, project finance is able to get over its worries about geothermal and how it can make its companies. And now it's actually really excited about investing. So this is a softball question, but just want to hear what your perspective is on that issue. Yeah, I I appreciate it. I I think that it's true. There are now more climate oriented project finance funds that exist than there maybe are projects to actually take on that capital. It is interesting though, from from our experience, we we've been fortunate so far in in attracting kind of impact oriented dollars and and raising at the corporate level. Um, but we were still surprised when we began developing this first kind project in Utah, just how risk averse the project finance community was on first of a kind, even though many of them have firm climate mandates. Um, and I think some of that is just timing. We we started this first project when interest rates were high and that changed people's perspective on risk tolerance. But now we are we are seeing the the tide turn and i think that is that speaks to the trend you're identifying that there're just a lot of investors and financiers looking for climate oriented projects one point that that i would just highlight from Burbo's experience is that it just takes one like as soon as we got a an agreement from an impact oriented firm for a construction loan, even though it's not gonna cover the majority of the CapEx for this first, first project, it's so much easier now to have conversations with financiers that were maybe unsure when we first reached out to them. And, and if there's anything to take away from our experience, it, it might be that you, you may need to start with a more niche firm, not, not the big names because those niche firms can sometimes go out on a limb and in our instance focus on rural job creation as a as a metric for underwriting or um insert any other sort of impact metric that that may make a firm more open to taking that first of a kind risk but once we had that anchor that we could point to um conversations have been a lot easier the other point i'll make is that some either financial institutions or big corporates that are now becoming interested in buying renewable tax credits, they have their own energy demands. Basically, any company has its own energy demands. And we have started to explore ways um, to work with large load customers and get them to bite off a piece of the CapEx uh, in exchange for agreeing to work with them down the road to, to supply clean energy. And that's a way to kind of address these dual constraints that the market is facing. One is the lack of supply for clean projects um, for, for financiers. The other is lack of supply of clean energy for uh, load customers. And if you can combine that into one process, then you can kind of kill two birds with one stone. Amazing. Well, thank you, Gabe. Um, I wish we could do this literally all day. It would be my personal dream, but unfortunately I think we're reaching the end of our hour um, and know that this was a pretty, you know, we rushed through a lot here or we went through a lot here. Um, but I hope, you know, I think that this ecosystem is just so vibrant and there's so many exciting things happening right now around first time projects. So I was really hoping that we could get a little bit of a sampling here of the different types of projects that are happening here directly from two folks who are working live on these projects themselves. And then we'll send around the report with some more of those details and sort of the guide for early stage founders. I um, would certainly welcome anybody's thoughts, feedbacks, further questions. It's a space that personally I'd love to keep doing research and work in. I think there's a lot of retrospective analysis that can be done as well around earlier stage, first of a kind projects and um, decades ago, seeing how those led to better or more improved pathways to scale. I think there's a lot of work to be done about thinking about what this looks like at an international level and some of the additional you know, currency risks, political risks that are introduced, but the really pressing need to build a sort of infrastructure all over the world and the, the capital availability being pretty uh, concentrated in a few locations. So a lot of 
interesting things that will keep going on in the first of the kind climate ecosystem. Really appreciate you coming in person and online. I think that's about it. If there's anything else we need to close out with the sustainable finance initiative, just that um, there will be another seminar on May 16th. Um, so if you're, here's a flyer out there about it, or you can visit our website to learn more about it. Um, and that'll be on emission liability management in the automotive industry um, for those that are interested. And just a big thank you to Matt and Steve for joining us. Thank you.